Well, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yes? Good. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be here with Tom DeRosa. Um, and I, I know this was built at a, as a fireside chat, but there's no fire. So we are going to actually have to create the We're heat. We're going to start it. Let's start it. <laughs> um, so there, there are many ways to start this conversation, but one is at the, at the point of data that I think has put both you and me on fire, which is the fact that as a, one of the profound, unprecedented human history successes that we have had as a society, and now the whole world is having, is that because of our investments, primarily in public health, some in education and poverty alleviation, and more recently in medical care, we have increased human life expectancy by 50%. That has never happened before in human history. And um, it means that all of us can expect to live, on average, into our 80s, 90s, or even 100s in coming years. Now, that profound success, which is really the result of human investment over the last 100 years, is now being seen in every country of the world, particularly as the AIDS epidemic has moved into treatment. People are surviving, and life expectancy is rapidly expanding in every country of the world. It is expected in the US that in a mere 12 years, 12 years, 20% of the US population is going to be over 65. 12 years is the blink of an eye. But by 2050, almost half of the world's population will be over 60. Almost half. Now, the thing we haven't done um, is recognize that this, to my mind, is the design opportunity of the 21st century. We've created longer lives, but we haven't designed a society to enable us to experience the real full benefits of it, nor have we redesigned our health systems to recognize what our longer lives both require and where the opportunities are to create health. So we're going to talk about that design opportunity with a focus on health and health care today. But it's within a larger ecosystem of huge opportunities, certainly for the business community, and broadly to contribute to the societal transformation to a world, a successful world of longer lives. So with that background, I'll just say that um, 30 years ago, um, it was not clear in medical science, in public health science, whether disease and aging were the same thing. It was not clear. In fact, it was arguments. There were arguments about this when I was in training. Um, is cardiovascular disease inevitable with aging? Do, will everybody become demented? Um, Fast forward several decades, and what medical and public health sciences have shown is that into the oldest stages, there are opportunities, profoundly important and significant opportunities to improve health and to prevent disease. And the two are not inextricably the same. Um, in fact, the US has done a very nice natural experiment, which was reported a year ago. Um, wasn't intended as a natural experiment, but what we've demonstrated is that if people grow up and live their lives with an adequate amount of resources and opportunities for investment in health, they actually arrive at age 70 healthy and are tracked to stay healthy. So that tells us that our human condition is highly malleable if we put the right things in place and we now also know that into the oldest stages, how we design our environments and our health systems and our health care systems matters tremendously in terms of how people age and whether they age um, with 
independence, whether they age in ways that are meaningful and satisfying for themselves and their family, and whether they age with more health rather than less. So my, my own premise, Tom, is that if we figure this design challenge out, we actually have the opportunity to then build the most possible health in our longer lives and the most possible function and, and create the conditions in which we actually lower cost while improving well-being. So that's a premise I want to throw out to you to see if that makes any sense to you. Well, <clears throat> exactly, it does, because this is something that we do every day. So we take the most at-risk population, which is the frail to demented senior, so generally 85 plus, and they live with us, about a quarter of a million people, live with us in a model of a concept that is key to what Linda was talking about, key to moving to a value-based health system, and that is called wellness. Now, what do I mean by wellness? That's a, name, that's a term we throw around a lot. Does that mean someone does yoga? Does that mean that someone's a vegan? Uh, what for this population, it means nutrition and hydration, it means physical movement, it means social and cognitive engagement, and it means safety. Because if you're 88 years old, and because of modern medicine, you've survived heart disease, you survived cancer, you survived many other diseases that might have been death sentences for your parent, but are now chronic illnesses. And that's why you're alive at 88. But there's certain things that don't work so well for you. You don't see so well. You don't move so well. And for many people above the age of 85, we don't think so well. And there is no magic pill for those issues. We have one of the world's authorities on frailty sitting with me here. Frailty is a major issue. And it is when you hear the statistics about the aging of the population. In just two years, the fastest growing age cohort will be the 85 plus, and that is going to continue for decades. And that will lead to the type of statistics about the age of the population that Dean Fried just cited. So what do we do? Because that will cause the health system that we have today, and you've heard this throughout the day, we have a health system in this country that is built to treat disease. And guess what? They've been very successful. They've been very successful, and we're all, everyone in this room should be very grateful to medical science. Except we're still trying to, we understand we need to move to improving health outcomes and lowering costs but we're trying to do it in an acute care hospital system, an acute care infrastructure that was built for, for the world 50 years ago or more. And it's not going to work. So unless we can get in front of treating disease and focus on health and focus on prevention, our health system and our economy will implode because of the aging of the population. So at Well Tower, again, we maintain this wellness model around this physically and cognitively impaired population. And we do achieve great outcomes. People who live with us go to the emergency room far fewer times than someone of their age living in a fifth floor walk up on 2nd Avenue. They, when they do get sick and they do go to that hospital bed, 
they spend the number of days that Medicare or another payer is reimbursing that hospital to treat them. And once they come out of the hospital, they can live again in this wellness model and comply with the, with the variety of elements that one needs to comply with to wind up, to not wind up back in the hospital. So we would like to think that the quarter of a million of people that we care for, that are paying out of pocket, understand everyone in this room, Medicare does not pay for this. This is solely the responsibility of the individual and it's very expensive. But what we're hoping is the learnings, the data that we collect on these outcomes will help the broader healthcare delivery system move in the right direction, move to this value-based model. And I think Linda said it, this is not a health, this is not a medical problem, this is a health problem, this is a public health issue. So um, tell me what, if, if we put this within the ecosystem, what you're doing, of um, what lately sounds like a buzzword, which is population health. Um, public, public health and schools of public health have historically for the last hundred years been responsible for population health um, of, in, in terms of understanding how to create all of our health and who's more vulnerable for what and how to deliver to those vulnerabilities so that you raise the floor as well as the ceiling. Um, in that population health perspective, what you're doing fits. Um, it doesn't exist within a hospital. It amplifies, if I understand correctly, the delivery of outpatient care and a continuum of care provision as well as enveloping it in uh, goals of health that go beyond medical care. And then you're starting to talk about whole population health system delivery with many components. So um, can you describe your model in that context in, with a little more specificity? So we are a residential care model. So essentially, we redefine what home is for this population, for this frail to demented population. What is it that generally causes someone to come to us, to choose to live in this wellness environment? The physician has told the family, mother needs 24-hour care. If you choose to bring 24-hour care in the home, it's very expensive. Let's talk about Manhattan. If you had a parent or a grandparent that had dementia, that needed 24-hour care, because they're not only a risk to themselves, they're a risk to others, it would cost between $24,000 and $36,000 a month to have three shifts of nurses in your home to take care of that individual. If you could even find them. If you could find them. $36,000 a month. Who can afford that? And frankly, it also means you, as the eldest child or the sibling closest to the parent, have to supervise it. It needs to be managed. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we take that situation and we take that individual and put them in residential, put that person in a residential setting where their nutrition is monitored, where we make sure that they're taking fluids in. I'll give you a story. My wife works in the emergency room at New York Presbyterian Hospital as a volunteer. She will tell you the frequent flyers there are elderly people in New York who come there because they have no other place to go and often they have a urinary tract infection. And that's what lands them. That's why they're not feeling so well. And that is costing the Medicare system 
or Medicaid or the hospital because they, these people don't have any insurance. It's costing them thousands of dollars just for that person to show up there and it could have been avoided if they drank water. So we provide the model of nutrition and hydration. We try and keep their bodies moving. If you sit in a chair in the fifth floor walk up for months because it's too cold to go outside in New York with the TV on, I can assure you, you will have negative health issues because of that. We don't allow that to happen. We keep people engaged with other people. Loneliness is a huge issue as we age. Some of you may have heard that Theresa May just formed a ministry of loneliness in the UK. This is a huge issue as people age and they live these solitary lives. And just think about the issues of safety and the breaches of safety. And I, I extend safety to physical safety to most seniors of 88 years old are probably taking eight to 12 pills a day that have been prescribed for their comorbidities. If you don't take these pills appropriately because you can't read the label, you don't have someone reminding you to take the pill, you become a major risk to our healthcare system. So these are the things that we provide. This model works, but it's expensive. We are about to open in, uh, not about, but in uh, 2020, we'll be opening the Well Tower on, on 56th Street and Lexington Avenue here in New York. And it's likely that the monthly rate will be over $20,000 for residential care. Now, usually there's a gasp in the audience, but if you were trying to, if you were trying to recreate that at home, I can assure you here in Manhattan, you're probably spending north of $30,000 a month and it still becomes an obligation of a family member to supervise. We, we are essentially are the outsourcer for that elderly person. So uh, this is a model, again, that we believe if we can demonstrate the positive health outcomes that we achieve, we can bring that to Washington and convince Washington that you should incentivize people who can afford this to take advantage of it. Maybe there's some tax incentive that, and the reason why people deserve a tax incentive, not to get political, but they're, by taking responsibility for wellness, they're taking themselves out of the Medicare and Medicaid system, which is freeing up capital to treat those people who can't afford this. So let's talk a little bit about value. And, and value-based care and value-based reimbursement, and um, because I know you're thinking about it a lot. But I'd like to, uh, to before you help us think about that, say there are many value propositions swirling around in what you're saying. Uh, there's a value proposition across generations that you've been talking about. Um, in terms of the implications for us as children, for the needs of our parents. Um, we were talking about our mothers before. I can, I can tell you that many years ago when my mother was caring for her then 85-year-old husband who was progressively becoming quite demented, um, at one point I had to give a speech on Capitol Hill and I asked her, um, it was in an era when anecdotes were data. So I... <laughs> <laughs> so I Has that changed? <laughs> I, I asked her to, to give me data for an anecdote, and the anecdote was that she was spending... She figured out that... So this is a woman with a PhD and a career. She was spending 20 hours a week managing the care, the round-the-clock care that her husband had, the bills, 
the doctor's appointments. So it was a, it was a halftime job for her on top of anything else she was doing. And she did it out of love, but it was a huge issue. Um, these intergenerational and familial issues are embedded in the value proposition quite strongly. And in fact, um, one, uh, one piece of history we sometimes lose is that the founding arguments for both Social Security and Medicare were to protect the standard of living and quality of life of working age people when they needed to do the right things by their parents. So um, in terms of the kinds of costs you're talking about. So it was an intergenerational set of policies that have been shown to have the kinds of mutual benefits that were intended. Um, so that's one kind of value you're talking about. The other kind of value has to do with the value for the individual in terms of the well-being that they're experiencing. And then there's this whole value proposition for society and, and, and goal, resetting goals for value-based care and health um, uh, creation. Couldn't think of the word yeah. for a second. <laughs> so, um, at one of the propositions here is that, I think, is that uh, you can see a lot of value for creating new kinds of models that are not hospital-centric for delivering health. So can you talk about the value proposition there and what, what you mean by value and value-based reimbursement? Well, that's a great, uh, I think that, that, that's a great question. Um, what we're doing is we're starting to connect this senior care network that we have in the US to health systems. Mm -hmm. So we are looking for ways to, you know, I, I think health systems for generations saw our business as retirement housing. And what does that have to do with healthcare? Well, in a world where most people were dead by the time they turned 72, and in a world where the health system was totally focused on treating disease, yeah, we were outside of their circle. But what we're starting to create are uh, collaborations with health systems. Uh, and that also extends to the settings by which they deliver medicine. So, I think many of you are aware of what used to happen in a hospital now happens in outpatient settings. Think about when I was born, my mother spent seven days in a hospital. Now, most insurers will fund perhaps an overnight stay in a hospital. It wasn't that long ago when you needed a hip replacement, you spent two weeks in a hospital. Now, Medicare and or other insurers reimburse that hospital for less than 24, uh, for less than a 48 hour stay in the hospital. Yet we have all this real estate that was built to deliver healthcare well, at least how we defined healthcare. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're hearing today is we're redefining mm -hmm. what that means. So we need, in order to move to this value-based system, we need to drive healthcare to more modern, cost-effective settings. Some of that will be in the home. We are now connecting our senior care facilities to health systems through telemedicine. So instead of paying to have one of our residents leave the building, have their son take a half day of work because mom has a doctor's appointment and a family member needs to be there, have that doctor appointment and then pay to transport mom back to the senior living residence. Now, she will have that doctor visit in the comfort of her room and her son will log on from his desk and participate in that 
visit remotely. Think about, that's just a small little example, but that is the future of how we need to deliver healthcare. We need to figure out how to drive people out of those hospital beds. I, I often am reminded by an ad two summers ago by Mount Sinai that's in the New York Times, and it said, if our beds are filled, we have failed. That is a profound statement. And I'm not sure they practice what they preach because most, most health systems are still thinking, boy, if I could just keep that person and get paid to keep them in my bed for a few days longer, all life is good. It's not good. They need to think, we need to drive healthcare to more cost-effective, modern settings and use technology as much as we can and manage these at-risk populations in models of wellness versus waiting for them to show up in an ambulance in an emergency room. So what's the U.S. Um, proportion of the GDP that is about to go toward medical care is 20 percent. U.S. spends less than 3 percent of its health dollars on prevention and public health, whereas that actually is responsible for 70 percent of any population's health. So we've kind of got it backwards uh, in terms of investments. So, and you're saying there's a value proposition that could, here for this segment of the population, which has high costs in that system, there's a value proposition that could drive costs down. How much of a difference could it make? I think it can make a huge difference. Um, I'm not able to quantify, mm -hmm. but think about this. There was a study that looked at death certificates by people over 85. The third most um, expensive cause of death was cardiac disease. The second most expensive was cancer. The third most expensive on a death certificate was death due to Alzheimer's disease. Think about that. If you had coronary issue, there's medication, there's treatment, there's surgical interventions that cause the meter to run in the health system. Same thing with cancer. I scratch my head when I see Alzheimer's. How could Alzheimer's, how, how could Medicare say Alzheimer's is the most expensive cause of death? They don't reimburse anything. You know why? Because there is no drug and there is no surgical intervention for Alzheimer's disease. Why is that the most expensive cause of death? It's because people are sitting in acute care hospital beds and there is no place to put them. So we're taking this population, we're putting it in the most expensive site of care and they're languishing and dying in these beds. And it is completely unacceptable. So if we can just get hold of that and try and attack that issue, how do we prevent people with dementias, including Alzheimer's, from dying in US hospital beds? We will save a significant amount of that spend, which I hope can be redirected to populations of people, younger populations of people who need mm -hmm. good health care. Tom, I have about a thousand more questions I want to ask you, but I'm seeing the signs that saying that our time is about up before we turn this over to the audience to ask questions. So I'll end with one thing. You clearly are immensely inspired and passionate about what you're doing. What lit that inspiration for you? You know, I, I, um, I see a industry, a huge sector of our economy that is just broken. 
and maybe when I put my Columbia Business School MBA hat on, you know, we were taught to go out and fix big systemic business problems. So I think it's, it's just, you know, I, I'm inspired by the challenge. Uh, you know, it was interesting. I think it was Roy Bergiano this morning was saying when he was, he graduated in 04, 03, and he was saying that like nobody went into healthcare. There was no interest in that. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really energized by um, this opportunity. I'm energized what Columbia is doing, thanks to Bunny, to really bring focus to this huge opportunity um, to make a difference. You know, Linda makes a difference every day as a physician and as a public health leader. Uh, you know, I don't, I think you can also make a difference in a for-profit setting. I think we are making a difference every day. I think we can change the course of healthcare delivery. That's what inspires me. Uh, I, I think we are making a difference and I think we're gonna make a bigger difference in the future because I'm seeing finally, whether it be major health systems, whether it be the payers, whether it be some of the world's largest technology companies, they all want to engage with us. They're, they're trying to say, how do we get involved in this wellness space? So it's exciting. It is pretty exciting. Well, on that note, we'll turn this over to the audience. Yes. Why don't you stand up and introduce yourself? I think yourself. we have mics, too. Uh, Arthur Kolker, CBS uh, 2016. I'm from Home Team, a home care company here in New York. Uh, I have a question. In New York State, at least, long-term care is a covered benefit under Medicaid. So I was wondering, do you work, any of your facilities, long-term care facilities, work with any Medicaid programs? Um, and have you been able to pursue any value-based deal with Medicaid, duals, or MA plans, or anyone else that covers so, the population? So, good question. Uh, in certain states in the U.S., um, any long-term care, there, there is, there's a category called long-term care facilities, which are for Medicaid beneficiaries. We're not in that business, but in, in many states, there has to be a certain number of beds reserved for people who are Medicaid recipients. Because let's just understand, Medicare pays for none of this. Uh, often those beds, uh, will be occupied by people who originally came in paying, not thinking they, were thinking they were going to live for three years and having the capital to fund their stay for three years. And, at the, and instead of living three years, they're now, they've now lived eight years and people run out of money. And often those beds are occupied by people who came in paying who are now no longer, who, who over time, we work with them to transition them to Medicaid. And so they don't, we don't send them out into the cold. They actually can stay in the facility. Uh, but this is, this is a big challenge. There, there is a lack of Medicaid available long-term care beds in many states, and there's very little funding for it. And uh, I can't tell you what the answer to that is. Uh, as a for-profit company, we need to be able to make a return on the investment that we make to provide this wellness model and taking government Medicaid reimbursement, if that was even available, would not cover the costs. So um, I, again, it's something I said earlier, I'm hoping that the data that we collect will incentivize government entities to start opening up funds, making funds available to create wellness models for people who, can, who cannot pay out of pocket. Thank you. Another question, yes, in the back there. Very interesting topic, and I have a question. I'm gonna try to simplify it because there's a lot of complexity to this, this topic. Um, but, so Tom, I definitely see the value of incubating ideas that come through Well Tower and, and what you're doing, but at a quarter million dollars a year, it's not really scalable. So is it possible to make it scalable, which would I would imagine would have to mean cutting your the costs in half and also getting federal funding 
in order to make it scalable for the majority of Americans? Or is it the idea just to have ideas and incubate um, ways of care that are then delivered elsewhere? That's a really good question. And I'm going to answer it simply. It's a little of both. Uh, but we are looking at ways to scale this outside of the wealthy population. I'll, I will tell you that we are talking with one of the largest employers in the United States who has a population of workers who, um, of six figures, so over 100,000 people, that make under $60,000 a year. If you are a person who now is working for this company and now has to take responsibility for their parent, their elderly parent, that person will have to quit that job to stay home and take care of that parent. And now you've forced two people into poverty. This employer has looked to us and we're, we are working on a model where that individual could keep the, his or her job and take mom or dad to work with them and put them in a residential facility that they spend eight to 10 hours in a day, which will allow that person, that elderly person to go home at night with their son or daughter, but come back with them in the morning and think about that. It's just, it's just a change in society. In the 1970s, women went back to work for the first time in scale. Some of them need, some, there were societal changes that drove women back into the workforce. Uh, and some of this was just a belief that women needed to be in the workforce. And how did employers respond? They set up daycare centers. So people brought their children to work with them. I think it is very conceivable that we will be bringing our elderly parents to work with us. Because this employer says, we're concerned about keeping our people engaged until they're 75. They need people to work. You know, if you're living to 100, this notion of I, I quit work, it's, I retire at 65 is crazy. It's crazy. And, and you'll just create legions of poor people because people will not be able to create enough savings to support this long life. So these are ways we're thinking about our business. How do we make it scalable to your point? How do you bring it to more people who need this? This is, this is not a nice to have. This is a necessity in the future. Thank you. There's a question over here. Hi. And the mic is coming. Hi, my name is Andrea Romero. I work for CNH Finance. We're a healthcare asset-based lending fund based out of Greenwich, Connecticut. Uh, so my question for you is, so 10, 15 years from now, after this is scalable, 2.0, made more accessible to the masses, how do you, how does um, Wellpower plan to maintain its competitive edge? So like other, maybe other VCs, other companies think, oh my God, this is so cool, like, let's also launch it. Like, what are some of the ways that you're thinking of keeping your strategic edge, I would say? How Great question. Great question. Um, data and informatics. Data is a key. You saw my friend Swagat this morning on the panel. Um, data is key. And I think enough, too few entities are investing in data. Uh, technology. Uh, we are working with some of the biggest names, uh, biggest technology companies who see the ability to take a lot of their technology and bring it into this wellness setting. How many people in this room have an Apple Watch? I'm surprised not more. I bet if I ask this question next year, 50% more, more hands will go up. Uh, there are tremendous health and wellness applications of the Apple Watch. And many of those applications are going to allow us to reduce the cost of what we do. So we're very excited about that. 
Um, and I think this connectivity, there is no, you know, it's interesting. I don't know of any other public company that defines itself around this space of wellness. And so we have a head start there. I just think we have to be smarter. And that's why I hire a lot of Columbia Business School graduates, <laughs> because they're really smart. Um, yes, question right here. Yes, please. Hi, uh, my name is Jason. I'm from Stony Brook University. And uh, my question is, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned how much resources are invested in like later stages. Uh, and that uh, if you invest in earlier stages in prevention, you have a bigger impact. And the second part, you were talking about your model in which basically is providing care to intermediate to later stages. So my question for you is, uh, how do you think we can create value in investing in the prevention part? So I think we'll share this. Yes. <laughs> um, in a little mind meld. So maybe I can start and say that um, what US science has shown over the last 50 years is that prevention both works and matters and is essential at every age and stage of life. And, and um, I, I would, my own analysis of that is that that leads to a profound shift in our public health goals so that we not only are committed to saving lives at the moment, and preventing unnecessary death, but we're investing in health now for each person's future. Um, it, the results of that are compelling. Uh, the 50% increase in life expectancy is one of um, many metrics that demonstrate that. One of the very interesting things is that um, one part of science that has not been invested in and is ill-developed is the science on the economics of prevention. Um, there, there are, is a lot of mythology, and, and I do believe it's mythology, that prevention doesn't pay. Um, and I think that mythology persists because we haven't invested in doing the science and because it's been um, bounded by short-termism. Um, in fact, the, the evidence that we have is that even that short-termism isn't right, that even in two years you see uh, profound benefits, but the societal long-term benefits are at 5, 10, and even 20 years for the whole population. Um, the U.S. population's health status has actually gone down compared to all peer nations. Our health status as a country is now at the bottom of our 33 peer nations in the OECD. And the, I believe, the evidence is that that's because we have increasingly disinvested in that side of prevention and wellness. Um, and and um, one metric of that is that 70% of any population's health comes from prevention and public health, and the U.S. puts 3% of its health dollars into that. But critically important, and I'll pitch this over to Tom, is that the data also show that no matter what the health status of an individual is, including at later ages, <laughs> And certainly there are many people increasingly in our country who are young and middle-aged who are sick. Yes. Who are sick and have multiple chronic diseases and have disabilities. So this is not limited to older adults. But the evidence is that at any age, we need new prevention strategies, but the ones we have developed, we have demonstrated work and matter in terms of improving health as well as longevity. So the, the, the value proposition is quite strong, but it requires, I think, thinking very differently about how we balance investments between prevention and care and how we distribute those preventive approaches so that, yes, they, they exist within your doctor's office, 
So your doctor tells you what you should do. That's using public health science for prevention in the clinical context. But they also exist in terms of how we design our environments, our contexts, and deliver the opportunity for health in a whole variety of contexts. And the evidence is very powerful. So I'm going to um, leave you with a little example of what Dean Free just said. Uh, a year ago, I was diagnosed by the Cleveland Clinic as being obese. I was horrified. <laughs> I was 25, 30 pounds heavier than I am now. So I took that seriously. And I'm no kid, I'm 60 years old. And I just wanna say you can change. I'm a believer that you can change behaviors. So I changed the way I eat. Before I didn't think about what I ate, and I changed the way I eat. And I went back to the Cleveland Clinic six months later and had every test imaginable without opening me up. And they said, your blood pressure is low. Your bad cholesterol went from high to low average. And we couldn't find any trace of plaque in your coronary system. We think you have a 0% chance of having a heart attack in the next 10 years. We also predict you're gonna to live to 105. <laughs> so how is it that I eat? I'm a fish egg. Does anybody know what that is? I'm a vegan and I eat a little fish. You can change your behaviors and live a healthier, long life. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all.